a lot more dramatic than in the United States. First of all, thank you, Martin, um, for that introduction and the invitation to speak at this conference. And it's just a pleasure and a privilege uh, to be back in Holland, visited here, obviously, when I was a student many decades ago, but also to be uh, at, at this conference sponsored by this agency. Um, we don't have a national spatial planning agency in the United States. I'm not sure even we have the word planning at times, um, particularly at the federal level. But I would just say that the topic of this gathering could not be more timely. We are living, I believe, uh, in a disruptive period which is altering the form and the function of our cities and metropolitan areas, which are obviously the engines of our economies and the centers of our trade and investment. And we're talking about large sweeping forces, market dynamics, fiscal constraints, energy transitions, demographic tumult, particularly the aging of our populations, technological advances, climate change. They are compelling cities and metropolitan areas to reshape their economies and remake their places after the crisis in the service of broader productive, innovative, and sustainable goals. In the US, in addition, and this is really the focus of my talk, something equally profound is happening. The roles and responsibilities of different levels of government and the private and civic sectors are being irreparably resorted. Now, I call this the Metropolitan Revolution, I have a book coming out on June 17th. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon, and you'll see bits of an app that will also be coming out that tries to animate this notion. The thesis is pretty simple and straightforward. In the aftermath of the Great Recession, U.S. cities and metros are recognizing that with our federal government completely mired in partisan gridlock, and most states adrift, they're essentially on their own to grapple with supersized economic and social challenges. The cavalry is not coming. Washington is not riding to the rescue. But fortunately, cities and metros and the networks of leaders who govern them, mayors for sure, county executives for sure, but more importantly, the network of business, civic, university, labor, environmental community leaders, they are responding with pragmatism, energy, and ambition to, as we say in America, get stuff done. They are stepping up and they're doing the hard work to grow jobs and remake their economy for the long haul. And they're really beginning to innovate, as I'll talk about, on the big stuff. Policies that drive the wealth-generating, tradable sectors of the economy. And they're doing it in a way that leverages their distinct assets and advantages. In Denver and Los Angeles, they're investing in transformative infrastructure, state-of-the-art transit to ensure mobility, the expansion of their ports and airports and broadband to enhance connectivity. In Cleveland and Youngstown, they are making manufacturing a priority again, basically building from the tight ecosystems of not just firms, but business associations, labor, universities, and newer intermediaries. Portland and Minneapolis St. Paul, they're devising bottom-up export strategies, connecting small businesses to global markets, and forging relationships with their partners abroad. Houston and Chicago, integrating immigrants, giving workers the skills they need. Detroit and Cambridge, as I'll talk about, creating vibrant innovation districts around their universities. And in New York City, if you went to New York City in 2005, and you asked Mayor Bloomberg, what is the essence of your economic development strategy, he would have said, we're building two stadia on the west side of Manhattan. If you went there today and said to Mayor Bloomberg and the business leaders and the university leaders, what's your strategy? They are building a network of applied science districts all across the city. Building or investing in stadia, we consider it to be parasitic, right? Investing in a tech-oriented, globally-oriented network of universities is catalytic. America, in short, is remaking itself from the bottom up, and I would say that this is fundamentally in tune with the zeitgeist of our age, which is crowdsourced rather than closed-sourced, entrepreneurial rather than bureaucratic, and networked rather than hierarchical. I think this is a structural, a structural rather than a cyclical shift. 
Um, and I think what we should do is change the icon iconic image of our republic, the American flag, play the first animation, and you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about. The American flag has traced the history of our nation. We started as a country of 13 colonies and grew into a nation of 50 states. But the iconic image of the republic no longer reflects how the country actually works. Power is shifting away from the federal government and even states to cities and metropolitan areas. While Washington and our states bicker and delay, cities and metros have emerged as the vanguard of policy innovation and action taking transformative steps to grow jobs and remake their economies for the long haul. There is a metropolitan revolution underway in the United States, and it's time to remake the flag to reflect how our nation really functions. Well, you can tell I'm very popular in Washington right now. Um, and I go around with a lapel pin that says the metropolitan revolution. I have a big flag in my office of the new flag, but you get the point. Um, power leadership is shifting in our country, and I think it's actually shifting to the level that in our age, where networks basically rule, cities and metros are essentially uber networks, where power for many of our decisions need to lie. Let me sort of talk about what's driving this, and, and the, the first thing I have to talk about is the economy. We have several challenges in the United States, and we should talk about at some point how the Netherlands and Europe compares. We first need more jobs. We need to grow 10 million jobs to make up the jobs we lost during the Great Recession, during the downturn, and then keep pace with population dynamics. We also need better jobs, right? We need jobs with higher wages and higher benefits. In 2000, we had about 81 million people in our country. Our country is about 310 million who were poor or near poor. In 2011, that grew to 107 million. 80 million to 107 million in one decade alone. We also need accessible jobs. We have 60 years of sprawl in the United States. Any typical metropolitan resident can access only 30% of the jobs in their metro area via transit in 90 minutes, right? So we have to think about more jobs, better jobs, accessible jobs. There's no easy way to fix, to achieve, uh, there's no easy fix to achieve these goals. I'm going to make two arguments. Um, the first is obviously we have to restructure our economy from one that's focused very inward and characterized by excessive consumption to one that's globally engaged and driven by production and innovation. And then we need to unleash those places, our cities and metropolitan areas, that are the engines of our economy and the centers of trade and investment and are now the vanguard a policy innovation. Let's just talk about restructuring of the economy first and foremost, and I'll relate this as I go forward to spatial planning. We need to think about an economic model where we export more, we waste less, we innovate in what matters, we produce and deploy, we produce more of what we invent, and an economy that actually works for working families. Um, in the logo and the, the branded way of describing this, we have to move to a next economy that is fueled by innovation, powered by low carbon, driven by exports, and rich with opportunity. And that's an economy that obviously is led by our metro areas. So let's unpack that just a little. And I think you'll find some of this quite interesting to the debate that I heard today and that you've been having over the course of the day. Why innovation, right? Because resilient growth comes from the interplay of invention, commercialization, manufacturing, and skilled workers. Now, in the United States over several decades, our discussion of innovation, if you said the word innovation in the United States, that had a very narrow context. It was really thought about something that was happening in advanced R&D in our ivory towers or with exceptional entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs. We forgot something in the United States that earlier generations understood, which is that link and virtuous cycle between innovation and production. Only 9% of our jobs in the U.S. are in manufacturing. 35% of our engineers work in manufacturing. Manufacturing is only 11% of our GDP. They account for 68% of private sector R&D in the United States and 90% of our patents. So going forward, the U.S. will innovate less 
if we don't produce more. And that means beginning to understand these ecosystems of innovation, not just the firms, but these networks of supportive and skilling institute, research and skilling institutions. Why low carbon? This is obvious in Europe, Europe. Obviously in the United States, when you say the word low carbon, you've already decided which part of the ideological spectrum you sit on. But from our perspective at Brookings, we think we have the potential to ignite a global green economic revolution. Um, it's not just a shift to a green economy, it's a greening of the broader economy, which will change ultimately everything. The energy we use, the infrastructure we build, the products we buy, even the homes we live in and the office and retail buildings we frequent. It's already happening, partly because of policy, uh, more here than in the US, but frankly also because of prices and because of innovation, whether it's regarding renewable energy or frankly our shale gas revolution. Why exports? Now, you know, the Netherlands' uh, long history as a trading culture. The US is an incredibly diverse country, but one of the most insular, inward focusing in the US, uh, focus in the world. Only 13% of our GDP comes from exports, right? We focus inward on our growth, but in a world where Brazil, India, and China together have a higher share of global GDP than the United States, we need to look abroad for a portion of our growth. And that means more firms in more sectors, particularly sustainable products and services, selling to more countries. Only 1% of American companies export, and only half of those firms export to more than one country. We have a behavioral change that we have to go through. Last piece is why opportunity rich. Obviously, if you're a productive and an innovative and a sustainable economy, you have more jobs that pay higher wages and higher benefits, and you begin to get at that opportunity gap that I described before. So that's a macro model. Let's cue the next video or next presentation so you'll get a sense of how the macro model comes to ground. So this is the true American economy, right? We are essentially a network of metropolitan economies that over the course of 70 years of growth have become two-thirds of our population and three-quarters of our GDP. And on every indicator that really matters in the prosperity of nations, they're punching way above their weight at 75, 80, 85, 90, 95 percent of the national share. There is no American economy. All the American economy is is a network of metropolitan economies that added up is our national economy. And as we begin to think about the shift to this next economy, very different kind of growth model for our country, in theory, what you'd want is a national government, right, that would set a platform for a shift as profound and fundamental as that. But with Washington really sort of focused on its own internal divisions, what we now have are cities and metros literally by themselves, one by one, beginning to ascertain, well, what sectors of the economy are we in? What clusters, what are the related industries that we have that really power the rest of our economy? And how do we leverage that, as I was saying before with my examples from different cities, with smart, strategic, transformative, game-changing investments in innovation, human capital, and infrastructure? So that leads, obviously, to spatial planning. Again, a term that it's, it's, it's hard for, for it to roll off the tongue for an American, right? But it's, uh, it, it's uh, I'll be forgiven. Um, when you think about what it means to grow to a different kind of economy, you clearly need to think about spatial implications every step of the way. If you want to grow an innovation economy, it's not just about that interplay between advanced ideas and production. It is about the creation of wired, um, large-scale innovation districts that really combine workers and institutions in close proximity and then mixed-use facilities and mixed-income housing that make up quality communities. 
you want to grow a low carbon economy, uh, it requires not only the invention of new technologies, cracking the code on carbon, but also the construction of renewable energy facilities, the infrastructure to store and transport such energy, uh, and then new sustainable products like EVs and the construction and retrofit of buildings. The physical landscape has to change. If you want to grow an export economy, it's not just about cities and metros and the national government helping both multinationals, but more importantly, small and medium-sized firms sell their goods and services abroad. It's really about that infrastructure to help move people, goods, and ideas quickly and efficiently and sustainably by air, rail, sea, and land. And finally, if you want to grow an opportunity economy, it's not just about skills and education. It's about accessibility. It's about less low-density sprawl, more high-density nodes, so that workers can actually live close to work and can actually get to work in a reasonable period of time. So we're making the argument that restructuring the economy in the United States post-crisis requires us literally to remake the form and function of cities and metros for a productive rather than just a consumption economy, for a sustainable rather than a wasteful society. There's one trend that I really want to focus on, which I think fundamentally affects how you're thinking about your work, both at this agency, but more broader in Netherlands and Europe. And that's what we're considering to be the rise of what we're calling innovation districts in the cores of our cities and metropolitan areas. Now, the way we define this is that innovation districts cluster and connect leading-edge anchor institutions and cutting-edge companies with smaller entrepreneurial firms, startups, right, but also mixed-use housing, office and retail, and 21st century amenities and transport. So this is a really seismic shift in how we think about building our cities and metros. In the 19th century, obviously, in Europe, but also in the industrial Midwest, we had industrial districts, right, that were characterized by a high concentration of industrial enterprises. In the middle and late 20th century, in Raleigh-Durham, in Silicon Valley, in suburban Washington, in Boston, in Seattle, we built science and research parks, right? And these were spatially isolated, they were accessible only by car, and they put little emphasis on the quality of place or integrating work, housing, and transportation. Something else is going on in the United States. It's been going on for a bit of time, but it's accelerated post-recession, and I'll talk about why. The downtowns and midtowns of cities like Cambridge and Detroit, Houston and Atlanta are seeing a growth in startups as well as residential and commercial growth right around their base of advanced research institutions, medical complexes, uh, and clusters of tech and creative firms. In some places like Boston and Seattle, they're actually taking former industrial land, generally close to waterfronts, and remaking those as innovation zones that are highly connected to transit and close enough to these eds in the meds. And if you went to Research, Research Triangle Park today, which is outside Raleigh-Durham, you would find the quintessential science park in the United States basically urbanizing itself. So we could attract young workers who literally want to live close to work, bike to work, or take public transit, and unless our science parks become more accessible um, and more uh, basically designed in that way, firms fundamentally believe they're going to lose um, workers to the, to the inner cities. Let's go to a third video, and then I'm going to keep going. America loves to celebrate the lone genius who cracks some secret code in a garage and single-handedly creates a whole new economy. But our national economy and the metropolitan economies that drive it are more than the simple sum of individuals and firms. Entrepreneurs rely on metropolitan ecosystems. Inventors build on ideas generated by universities and public and private research centers. Their inventions are built by skilled workers, and their goods and services are transported by planes, trains, and automobiles. Garages may work for rock bands, but metros power our economy and determine our prosperity. Okay, 
in the United States, if you went to most departments of economics and you sort of said, you know, what's powering the country, you'll still get sort of a neoclassical view about firms and workers. And you won't really have, for the most part, a conversation about these ecosystems. And this tight interconnection between firms and entrepreneurs and the quality of place and the health of infrastructure and advanced R&D and collaboration across public, private, and civic sectors, right? So what's happening in the U.S. is we are beginning to understand the relationship between the enterprise and the ecosystem. And when you see these innovation districts emerging in our cores of our cities, what you're really seeing is the physical manifestation of a penchant among firms for open innovation, right? Don't go out to the suburban campus in isolated facilities, right, where you never leave your building literally, your cafeteria is in the basement, right? Go into these wired urban districts, whether they're in suburbia or in cities, so that your workers can intermingle with workers from related firms, right? And they also have access to better amenities uh, in these particular places. So we're talking about competitive places and cool spaces integrated. So this is a virtuous cycle of worker preference and firm demand. And it really comes back to something that Saskia Sassen said a couple years ago. There's something about the next economy revaluing cityness, right? Complexity, density, diversity of people and cultures, the convergence of the physical environment at the multiple scales, the messy, the messy intersection of activities, a variance of distinctive designs, the layering of the old and the new, though the U.S. is not that old. And I think one thing as you go forward in your own particular professions, whether it's the national agency um, or more local or metropolitan or more provincial, is that how you deliver innovation districts. I mean, even the notion of delivering an innovation district is quite odd because these are more organic kind of communities differs remarkably across the United States, but the one thing that tends to be uniform are these stakeholders, these networks of public, private, civic, university that together are collaborating to compete, right? There's no federal program in the United States that's stamping out innovation districts city by city or metro by metro. If I went to into a cabinet agency in Washington and said innovation, they wouldn't even know what I was talking about, right? This is really something organically happening from the bottom up, building from profound, I mean profound, changes in the dynamics of our economy, both within our firms and in the preferences of our workers. So questions that you might have, do you have innovation zones in Holland? What's their size? What's their geography? Um, or how are they being created, nurtured, or leveraged? And they, can they be centers not just of sustainable growth or innovation growth, but even for the next wave of manufacturing, which is beginning to happen in the United States? Last point. You know, innovation districts are just an example of the metropolitan revolution. Economy shaping and place making that happens from the bottom up. Again, cities and metros may not be in our constitution, right? I mean, the U.S. Constitution, going back to the flag, is just the federal and the states, right? But cities and metros are the engines of the economy and the centers of trade and the vanguard of population growth and demographic transition. And now they're really stepping up. Not necessarily because they wanted to, it's not like they basically rang up Washington and said, we would like you to basically collapse into partisan dysfunction, right? I mean, that, there was no call from cities and metropolitan leaders to our national government say, you know, like Elvis, leave the building so that we're going to have to do everything on our own. But they are responding to a de facto structural shift. So when I go around the country and I basically say to business, civic, political, university leaders, by the way, you're on your own. Everyone just sort of nods. 
and say, got it. Then the question is, what's our revolution? What's our revolution in Phoenix? Or what's our revolution in Boston? Or what's our revolution in Chicago, right? And we basically say, here's three ideas for every city and metro to basically engage in. First, form those networks of civic, political, business, university, social, community leaders who take ownership and responsibility for social and economic progress. You know, in some places, if your mayor or your county, if your elected leaders can convene the network, great, wonderful. But if they don't or they won't, then take a look around and figure out who your leaders are, because you'll find them in your companies and philanthropies, in your universities and unions, in your civic and environmental and community groups. So convene yourselves, collaborate to compete, and do grand things together. Second piece is declare your distinctive vision, right? one that is rooted in sound economic thinking, local data. And that means that places need to know what makes them special, right? What makes Phoenix competitive on the world stage that differs from what propels Pittsburgh? Or what makes Denver a different global metropolis than Detroit? Building on those differences, right, than trying to be like everyone else. Oh, we're going to be the next Silicon Valley, right? That's what they always say in the United States. Good luck. Get a grip, right? We believe that the 20th century philosopher Dolly Parton had it right. Find out who you are and do it on purpose. Last point is find your game changer. Find your game changer. I'm not sure if that translates into Dutch. I hope it does. Discover and deliver the intervention that alters the trajectory of your economy, changes your image, and remakes the form and shape of your community. In New York City, again, if you ask Mayor Bloomberg, what's your game changer? It was attracting Cornell and Technion to build a 21st century science university that they don't have. If you went to LA, it was financing and building a world-class transit system primarily off of local resources. Federal government, very little. In Cleveland, it was repurposing their manufacturing heritage. So what's your game changer? What's the gift that will keep on giving, not just in the next three or five years, but for the next generation? You look back in 30 or 50 years and said, those leaders handed us a tremendous legacy through smart and strategic and sustained investments in the right thing. So I think this is how we're going to renew America. I think we're going to renew America from the bottom up, and I think this is how we're going to remake our politics, by practicing pragmatism over partisanship and elevating collaboration over conflict. And the question really, I think, uh, easier for you to answer than for me, um, is how does this apply to Netherlands and to Europe? And from an American perspective, we think you were already there, right? Because before you were a nation, when you think about the evolution of this country, you were a powerful group of cities, like Utrecht and Harlem and Amsterdam. And before you were a European Union, you were essentially, and this is really going back, a network of trading cities, like the Hanseatic League, right? Europe reflects 500, 300 years ago, essentially the kind of bottom-up, place-driven, distinctive understanding that we're basically proposing for our country. You grew because your cities were strong and they were resilient and they creative. You literally powered the world because your cities were rich in leadership and resources. And when I look at Europe, I, what I fundamentally see is the power and the quality and the specialness of cities in metropolitan areas, not the hierarchy of bureaucracies or parliaments. So hidden beneath the EU superstructure, right? Just like hidden beneath our federal government, primarily bloated after decades of accretion and incrementalism, 
is this incredible network of communities that have the potential uh, to grow and prosper and thrive. So my message to this group, well, besides buying the book and getting the app for free, um, is embrace the metropolitan revolution. Enable it, empower it, nurture it, lever leverage it, catalyze, inspire it. Thank you very much. Looking forward to questions. Thank you, Bruce. Um, you had a, an all-encompassing vision for the U.S., and obviously it's, it's uh, risky to say that we're already there. People might not uh, immediately agree, but there's one question that I'm at least intrigued by, if I can kick off the discussion. That is that you say you expect production to come back to American metropolitan areas. Now, we of course outsourced all of that, and wh why do you think it will actually reshore? The U.S. still has a major production platform. We have a rhetoric of being a post-industrial economy that has really persisted for about 20 to 30 years as if all we had to do was to be the center of idea generation and then the Chinese would produce everything, right? That was the narrative that we had in both of our political parties. But while that narrative was going on, we retained a strong production base, particularly in aerospace and automotive and high precision manufacturing and high quality pharmaceuticals. The emphasis is on quality, right? And we're the third largest exporter of manufactured goods after China and after Germany. So we still have a base, and now with wages rising in China and with the shale gas revolution in the United States, so energy is cheaper and more reliable, and with the disruptive 3D imaging that is occurring, which means you can do small batch manufacturing right next to your advanced R&D sectors and your medical campuses, there is not only a sense, there is evidence that we're having a reshoring phenomenon. And we have major CEOs of American-based multinationals who basically have said, we, re we offshored too much here. We should have kept more in the United States, and frankly, if we were looking for a lower cost option, we should have sent it to Mexico, not to China. There's something profound happening in the United States, but it is so counterintuitive mm -hmm. to 20 to 25 years of being told manufacturing is dead that it, it takes quite a while for people to understand that this is a real possibility. And frankly, we're going to have to change our language because the word manufacturing, like the word globalization in the United States, is not a positive word. So we're going to have to find a new language to basically describe the potential, not for, for a nation, but for people. Okay. Now, and a second question. When you talk about metros, metropolitan areas, right. how does the Netherlands qualify? Are we a metropolitan area or a country? Well, you're, you're, you know, you're a country of 17 million people. The way we define metropolitan areas is really around commuting patterns and labor markets. Um, you know, this is a definition that has existed for quite some time. Occasionally, it helps to have a factual basis in the United States for conversation. Um, that was not a partisan comment. Um, so I, 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 it is very easy in such a large and diverse country as the United States to understand, based on this commuting pattern definition, really where the organic, integrated, interconnected economies lie. Now, the U.S. is obviously the land of sprawl. So if you can picture this, 50% of people who live in rural areas live in metropolitan areas because the metros have sprawled out so far that many people living in rural counties commute back in, not to the city, but to middle suburbs or exurbs. So I think the issue for the Netherlands, issue for Germany, issue for France, issue for Britain, is what are these commuting patterns look like? Because I think that will begin, I mean, in Britain they call them travel to work areas, that will begin to give you a sense of how your nation actually is organized around work and travel. Um, and I think in the U.S., 
it has given us a spatial platform on which to build networks of leadership around shared challenges. Infrastructure, environment, labor, housing. It's not that cities, you know, leaders in cities and suburbs and rural areas love each other. They don't. But they do feel the need to collaborate to compete in a globalizing world around these critical levers of change and investment. Thank you. Who could I ask for questions from uh, the floor? Who, there are two microphones, I think. Um, somebody who is not very accessible. Can a microphone be? <laughs> one, one second, because otherwise people won't hear your question. Rietske Terveld, environmental professional. You talked about low carbon and shale gas revolution. How do you combine that? Well, shale gas is lower carbon. I would not call it yeah, low lower carbon. than lower, lower. coal. Right. But at the same A time. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the U.S., you know, is a country which, frankly, is intensely polarized around the issue of climate and the need to fundamentally change the supply of our energy uh, and the way in which we arrange ourselves spatially, right? I mean, we are a bad actor and have been a bad actor for a very, very, very long time. So it's hard really to talk about the low carbon agenda in the United States without talking about it as a market phenomenon, right? And as something which is essentially the next wave of economic evolution in the world, and therefore the U.S. has to basically get on board. I, shale gas, you know, is a, is a technological innovation. There are still environmental issues that are quite profound that are being sorted out mostly by the states, not by our national government, mostly by our states. But I think it may be perceived really as, um, you know, potentially a, a bridge to a different kind of future. But it is so intensely polarized and fragmented in the United States. I mean, I was just in Houston last week, which is the center of the global energy market to some extent. And I got up and started talking about low carbon and the emails coming back <laughs> were quite dramatic. Though, at the end of the day, um, there is an understanding that if, if there is going to be a market for solar or wind or, you know, name your favorite renewable, the U.S. has to fundamentally um, engage from an innovative perspective, from an innovative perspective to, to basically uh, stay ahead of the curve. But doesn't that mean that you then need national policies to price CO2, for instance? Well, that's not going to happen anytime soon. I, okay. I, I think what's going to happen in the United States are regional policies at the size of a California, 30 million people, or the size of a New England, where six or ten states come together around a regional compact, as they've done. I think the days of national solutions to these kind of issues um, are not over, but they are going to be delayed and they're really going to have to depend on city up, metro up, state up innovations to the point where our national leaders just fundamentally become the followers in our nation, not the leaders anymore. Okay. Please, the gentleman over here. Yes. Please stand up. Dick Vanhout from the Wind Fall Hall. Um, we are working about uh, 20 years now on the environmental right. issue uh, and the government is finally coming behind and picking up and next year we will solve the problem. Uh, how do you see the influence of the grassroots level which is even lower than uh, the building up from um, the, the metropolitan areas? How do you see the connection between really the persons, the people, right. and these metropolitan areas where we have 500 about in the world, uh, how do they work together in the perspective of the new global world rather than uh, the United States, the, et cetera, yeah? 
So I think that's a really interesting question because in the U.S. we talk about, I'm not sure this is language that would translate here, but uh, the grass tops and the grass roots and the grass tops in cities and metropolitan areas would be your mayor or the head of a business association or the chancellor of a university or so forth, head of a union, right? And the, the grass roots are really people um, at, the, at the very micro level beginning to change the configuration of a block or of a neighborhood or of a district. I, I think we're beginning to see a blend of these. And part of it is because of social technology, media technology. Uh, this is changing how we govern in the United States. And there's a phrase that we use called do-it-yourself urbanism, right? Where people literally are taking control of portions of the city or portions of the metropolis and then using social media to engage, quote unquote, the grassroots, their leaders. And we're having lots of really intriguing network that's occurring across these different levels, uh, venues, collaborative space. Um, the smart politicians, all right, the smart politicians understand that if you can engage this highly technologically sophisticated citizenry, um, you can present yourself, essentially, as a leader of the future. Now, sometimes these political leaders actually believe in some of what's happening at this DIY level, but sometimes it's just smart politics. I mean, frankly, you know, at the end of the day, outcomes are what matter. So, um, I never really look that far into the souls <laughs> of our political leaders. But I think technology, um, if you go into any major metropolis today in the United States and you look at Twitter and you look at Facebook and you look at LinkedIn and you, and you begin to see the way in which people are sharing innovation in smaller spaces, let's say, and then seeing it spread and replicate and then scale, that's a different theory of change than going to a government, may I, you know, typical hierarchy. May I please get a change in this rule or a change in this law or a decision here? This is much more activist, much more inclusive, much more populist in many ways. I think we're at the shallow end of the pool of participatory democracy and citizen-led democracy, and you're seeing it in our cities and metropolitan areas. Okay. Who's next? Another question. Please, the lady up front, there's a microphone coming up. Could you please stand up and say who you are uh, when the microphone arrives, of course? <laughs> I have a question about these innovation districts. To what extent do you think that these should be really nice places to be or should, so should there be opportunities for consumption? Are there as important as opportunity, opportunities for production? I think what you're going to see is a mashup, frankly. Um, and you're already seeing it um, in places like Houston and Atlanta. Um, and Boston, and Detroit, and Cleveland, and Seattle. The way the United States developed, right, we're a young country. The way we developed in most of our cities is the downtowns, what we call the central business districts, had the headquarters of firms, and then had basically cultural institutions, entertainment venues like sports stadia and so forth. And then the midtowns, relatively short distance away, let's say, two miles away, three miles away, had our universities and our medical campuses. And in the last 15 or 20 years, what has happened is we've built light rail to connect these things. We used to have streetcars, but then we ripped them all up, essentially. So only places like Boston or New York or Philly or Chicago had subway systems. But the last 15 or 20 years, you've seen a proliferation of light rail connecting your downtowns to your midtowns. These were never really residential areas. They were business areas and academic er and healthcare areas. What we're now seeing is a filling in of this space. It could be five square miles, it could be seven square miles, a filling in of residential, retail, amenity, startup, small batch manufacturing. It's, this is phenomenal resettlement, not just of people and business, 
and what I really like about it is, is that mashup, right? Is it, 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 it has that crazy quilt kind of quality to it where there's, it's not really dictated in any particular way. It sort of defies the way we used to think about zoning, which tended to segregate uses. This is the integrations of use, integration. This is really cityness coming back to the United States. And I have said to commercial banks and to investment banks and to sovereign funds, if you want to invest in the next wave of American growth, physical development as well as economic innovation, go find these places because that's where you feel the bubbling in our country. Now, the federal government, again, their contribution to this is to basically send tens of billions of dollars in research money into the universities and the medical campuses. And that's a pretty major contribution because that's a platform. But other than that, you know, the national government's not that involved. Um, the states, it depends on which state you're in as to whether they're cognizant of what's happening. It's really city, metro, private and civic. It, it's, it's a fascinating development and I think in 10 or 15 or 20 years, we'll look back at what's happening in the United States and what's already beginning to happen in places like Seattle and Boston and say, my Lord, that was a different kind of growth in the US. Mm -hmm. Mostly powered, mostly powered by non-governmental sources without any real structure. So, you know, that's sort of more quintessentially American, chaotic, right? <laughs> you know, chaos, chaos but um, I do think that the, the potential is, is, is quite enormous. Okay. And is, is there, uh, that when people, there's a pool in the metropolitan areas, but there's also a push from the suburbs because the yeah. American way of life from the 1950s onwards was very suburban, uh, the car, the big house. Is there a push? Why, why is this American way of life on the demise? Well, I think, you know, America is a complicated place. So, we're 310 million people, we'll be 400 million people by the mid-century. It's always hard to say there's one uniform trend in the United States. We have densification, we have sprawl, right? Um, we have, you know, different households, you know, the cohorts with very different perspectives and attitudes. Um, but what you can say with some definiteness about this period, it's been underway, I would say, since the mid-90s, is there's a different psyche about the younger generation, particularly younger generation with education or particular skills, about where they want to live in urban places, whether they're in suburbs or in cities. A lot of our urban places actually are in older suburbs, and how they want to maneuver and navigate their way through their metropolis. There's more walking, there's more biking, there's more um, car sharing, there's less for younger people getting the driver's license. That used to be a rite of passage in the United States. You're 16, what do you do? You get your driver's license, right? That's shifting now. The, the, the cool status symbol is to have an iPhone, right? Or, or, to, or to basically live in a up and coming kind of area, city or older suburb, with your networks of friends, using social media, to meet up and pop up and all the rest of it. Something is changing. Now, again, it's not uniform, and you've got to sort of combine these kinds of younger demographic trends with the aging of our population, which frankly is the demographic tsunami for all of our countries, and how that changes settlement and how that changes innovation, production, right? That probably is one of the most profound changes we both have to deal with. Um, but you know, the U.S. is, uh, you know, The Great Gatsby is now out. It's the new film. I'm not going to say go see it because I haven't seen it yet. But people always reinvent themselves in the United States. Places always reinvent themselves in the United States. I mean, that's part of our dynamism, and I think that's exactly what's happening now. Okay, good. One final question, perhaps. The gentleman at the far back, who I recognize as being this guy that started the day. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, 
What is quite striking from a European perspective is that you talk about the Great Recession as if it is already an historical event. Right. Whereas in Europe, we're still mired in the midst of this recession, which seems to be going on and on and on and on. Um, it, the Wall Street Journal recently had an article indicating that the U.S., since the outbreak of the crisis, has already cumulatively grown uh, to the extent of 3.2 percent, whereas Europe is back 2.8 percent vis-à-vis 2008. So a simple question, what did you guys do right and what, we, did, what did we do wrong? Um, a couple different thoughts about that. Um, First of all, going back to a main thesis, is that the U.S. is a network of metropolitan economies. So there's only a few metropolitan economies that have actually regained the jobs they lost, right, since the beginning of the recession. And most of those tend to be in places like Texas, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin. There's a group of consumption metros like Vegas, uh, southern Florida, um, you know, even places like Rhode Island, frankly, Providence, that are still hammered. And, you know, you go to these places, you would be hard-pressed to get anyone to say, we're out of the recession. They're still mired. And then you have the rest of the country, which is partly back. And I, I, I think what has happened, this is a dramatic blow to the United States, and I, I would not minimize it at all, um, and it really did force us to question some fundamentals, as I'm describing, about our growth model. That said, what, what has the U.S. done to respond? We did respond very quickly, right? We responded both under former President Bush, we responded under Barack Obama. Uh, we made major, sizable interventions to shore up our banking sector, to shore up our auto sector, um, to basically follow the Keynes model, $787 billion of stimulus. We can all argue whether any of this was done well, but it was done fast, right? And it was done um, almost against the general sort of narrative that I've just put out of a country in gridlock, because, or a national government in gridlock, but that's because we have a very, very, very powerful Federal Reserve Bank. And, and they were able to basically scare the bezizas out of our elected officials so that we, we had to act. For, for all intents and purposes, people like Ben Bernanke have been running the United States for the past you know, five or seven years. So we had a structure in our country, and we're a unified market, right? Um, we don't get up in the morning in Virginia and worry about bailing out Mississippi, right? I mean, that's not what we do. <laughs> um, Germany and Greece, uh, that's an interesting conversation. I mean, you know. So uh, our political system and the way in which we engage together fiscally is really, really quite different from Europe. In a way, we look at the EU and see sort of vestiges of an early part of our development back in the late 18th century. So I think we had the right structure to act quickly. We did. Um, and then, you know, if a state or a municipality makes mistakes, eh, that's their problem. Um, you know, the courts will figure it out or they'll be punished by someone else. We don't have the same sense that everyone, all regions, have to be treated the same. So the U.S. is a competitive place, it's a Darwinian place at times, but it, it seemed to have the right tools and right structure to engage. All that said, we're not out of it totally yet. And I think the key from my perspective is to accept the fundamental lessons about um, the inadequacy and the misguided nature of our growth model pre-recession so that we can move forward, going forward, with a more productive, innovative, and sustainable economy. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Bruce Katz. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Yeah.